episode of Living Mindfully with Tourette's Syndrome. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, mindfulness is just something that all of us can practice, obviously. Um, just the idea of becoming more aware of what's happening, what's happening around us, what's happening inside of our bodies, what's happening inside of our minds, all the noise, all the conversations that we have with ourselves. Um, just to be more aware of that. I, uh, this is a, a recent story of, of, a, of an interaction I had with someone recently. Um, I had just met this person and we were talking, we were having dinner, and they noticed that my eyes were um, ticking or, you know, they were, I was squinting a lot, I was like rolling my eyes, and <laughs> they couldn't tell if I was annoyed or upset or angry or what was going on. So they, they asked, thankfully they asked, they're saying, what's wrong with your eyes? Are, are they dry? Do you, do you wear contacts? And I had to say, oh, you know, I'm actually, I have Tourette's syndrome and um, this is a manifestation of a lot of different things caused or triggered primarily by stress and diet and sleep. Um, and currently I'm going through a divorce and my job's really unsteady and so uh, my Tourette's has been acting up more or being triggered more frequently. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of annoying. It's definitely felt more, more apparent, more more obvious as a part of my experience and it helps to talk about it um, even talking about it right now with you I feel like my attention is drawn to it and I can just kind of notice it as it happens or notice the impulses as they come and notice as they go too it's definitely not something that's like uh, needs to be um, you know released or manifested in tick that I'm experiencing, or the sensation that I'm, my body is experiencing, or maybe, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of other things to say about it, it, it was definitely helpful to talk about, um, it, it reminded me of when I was younger, and I was really trying to hide it a lot of the times, and I'm sure unsuccessfully most of the time. But um, if someone acknowledged it, I felt a lot of shame and I felt a lot of uh, failure to hide it. So I think being 34 now, um, it's been great to just be able to own it and just be able to say, hey, this is a part of my experience. And, you know, it's not good or bad. It just, it is what it is. And uh, that, so that is an interesting concept. It is what it is. Um, I'm listening to these philosophers talk about this a lot. And my own philosophy has changed a lot over the years. Uh, I'm sure all of you have changed your ideas as you've grown older and wiser and whatnot. Um, but one of my philosophies philosophical changes um, pivots around the idea of what is real um, and like like how do we know something's real or true or or how do we um, what's a better way of describing this how do we know what we're believing is for good reasons versus bad reasons um, to be true. Um, so a lot of times we can deceive ourselves to think something is true when it's not. So we can come up with all sorts of reasons to believe these things and um, someone who's gay who is afraid to come out as gay is one example. You know, they're saying I'm attracted to men or women, but I'm not going to 
I'm not going to acknowledge that attraction, that idea, that impulse, that feeling. Um, Tourette's, it was similar when I was younger, you know, I didn't want to acknowledge that it was a part of my experience. And so I would try to hide it. So, um, gorgeous here. In Colorado right now. Sorry, Utah. Drive through the mountains. Um, yeah, but like acknowledging what is it takes a lot of courage. I think of people, all of the, think of all of the, the weight loss and age defying creams that we put on our skins and put on our bodies, all the procedures we'll use to make ourselves look younger and fitter and all the post-production technology like Photoshop that we'll use to make ourselves look different, Instagram filters, Snapchat, whatever. You know, all of these things to make us look different than we are. Really kind of bending, bending reality in a way that makes our ego feel better. Makes us feel younger, fitter, stronger, sexier, more lovable. Um, the lovable piece, I think that's uh, one of the hearts of the matter. It's like when we can truly love ourselves to a point that we don't need to fear. Fear not being lovable anymore. It's a good, it's a good place to be. Because then we can just say, this is who I am, this is how old I am, this is how heavy I am, this is how fit I am, this is how scared I am, this is how um, anxious I am, this is how intelligent I am, these are some of the roadblocks I face, these are some of the insecurities I have. And I think that's a part of it. So just know that, um, you know, like if I had to speak to my previous self who may still believe in some of these ideas of what's lovable, what's right, what's wrong, what looks, what we are supposed to be or look like, um, I would probably say to that person, which you may identify with, whom you may identify with or, or, or not, um, I would say to them, hang on, keep on um, processing these things, keep on thinking about these things, um, ask questions, and seek mentors because, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are experiencing the exact, well, not the exact, but a similar situation to what you or I may be facing and the more we can become in tune with those people the more we can learn from their experiences and the more we can you know grow from that so yeah that's the thought for today um, hope you're enjoying this video uh, let me know in the comments or whatever Hit me out with any questions you may have uh, regarding Tourette's or living mindfully and hopefully I'll try to answer them or point you to some resources, which might be a good time to point out some resources now. Um, so ideas around this whole concept of what is real, truth, philosophy, these are philosophical ideas, okay? And you don't really need to think too deeply about them yourself because people have already done the hard lifting. So all you need to do is know where to look and know what to read and know who to listen to in order to follow along with these different ideas. I was recently having a talk with my mom about religion and how I am not religious anymore and she was saying things like, I expected from a religious person, like, how do you know what's real? How do you know what's true? How do you have any sense of morality? And she was genuinely interested and intrigued with my answers. Um, you know, she thought I had done some real reflection there, and, and I have, but 
I have to give credit to where it's due because a lot of these things I have just been curious about and and interested in and have learned from other people and then I'm kind of paraphrasing, regurgitating in a way that I hope would make sense to the person I was talking to, which happened to be my mom. So yeah, um, a good place to start for someone intrigued with those ideas I'm going to throw out um, will be a guy named Sam Harris. He's probably more... Uh, He's probably more geared towards uh, an older audience, just because his language is um, expansive, his vocabulary is expansive, it's large, he knows a lot of different words, he's very articulate, and he's, um, he can be difficult to follow sometimes if, if you're not ready for it, so take that to heart, um, but yeah, give him a listen, he has a podcast called Waking Up. And he talks a lot about meditation, he talks a lot about religion, he talks a lot about um, truth and reality and the nature of things. Um, but it's all related. It, it's, really, it's really all related. Um, so just know that like, the worldview that you have, the worldview that I have, affects everything that we do and it affects the way that we perceive the world. So there are different worldviews that we will adopt over our lives. I'm guessing, you know, unless you're like a super orthodox religious person that wants to keep that orthodoxy charging forward through the millennia, um, your ideology is going to change. And so it's just interesting to note how your ideology, how your worldview changes, you know, why you believe in your worldview and what does it mean, you know? What would it what would it look like if your worldview changed? How would that, you know, affect different parts of your experience? Um, my experience is that it's hard to know how how your worldview or how your experience will change based on your worldview changing because it's really hard to like have a mind um, what would you call it, like a, a mind experiment where you're trying on these different philosophies and these different worldviews in real, in actuality to really adopt them, you know. It's hard to do, and so sometimes you have to just wait till, till it does change, so. I would recommend keep reading, listen to podcasts, and keep asking questions. So... Yeah, I hope, I hope your lives are going well. I hope, um, I hope, I hope to learn more about your experiences with Tourette's and with living mindfully. Um, uh, I just signed up for a, what is it? It's a seven or five day silent meditation retreat in Portland. So I'm excited for that experience. Um, it's like a guided meditation. Uh, there's a lot of these different types of meditations around that you can participate in if you're interested. If you've never participated in a silent meditation retreat, I recommend a shorter one to start out with just because they can be uncomfortable and they can be um, just really challenging on a lot of different levels. Uh, my family is still can't understand why I, I go to these things, but uh, yeah, that might be another resource to look into for becoming more in tune with our experiences. Alright, well this is getting kind of long, 14 minutes, so I will leave you there. Um, yeah, see you next time.